Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Marcia Butler, the Webinar Director at Vice Chaser. Before we introduce our guests and get started, I do need to do a bit of legal housekeeping. Advice Chaser, the host of this webinar, is not a registered investment advisor. We cannot and do not give financial advice. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only and cannot be considered advice for any person's individual situation. Advice Chaser regularly hosts informative webinars, such as this one, featuring a variety of knowledgeable professionals, many of whom are licensed advisors. Any opinions, ideas, jokes, or principles expressed by presenters are their own, and however true, funny, or interesting, are not endorsed by Advice Chaser. Please do not act on the information you hear today without consulting a qualified financial professional. We're thrilled to bring you this educational presentation. Attendees are muted, but we encourage you to ask questions in the chat box. The presenters will the presenter will answer those queries during or after the webinar today as appropriate. And if you ask a question in the chat box that we don't have time to get to, go ahead and leave your phone number as well. We can get, if we can't get to your question, we'll make sure someone reaches out to you after today's event. We want this experience to be as educational as possible. So please don't hesitate to ask for clarification or expansion of the material. I'd like to introduce you to today's moderator. Uh, Terrence Palauskas is Senior Vice President of Redbit, Redbridge Financial. He has over 20 years of experience helping individuals and businesses reach their financial goals. He provides guidance on retirement planning, business continuation planning, trust management, and conservatorships. Terrence and his wife enjoy traveling, camping, and raising Doberman Pinchers. He is very active in his charitable work. He volunteers weekly in a community education outreach program, and he has had many public speaking appearances throughout the United States and Central America with audience of, audiences of up to 5,000. Terrence, I'm gonna turn it over to you to say a few words that, uh, for, for our guests today. Thank you. Well, I, I have been privileged to get to know many successful business owners. And over the last 20 years, I've, I've helped them set financial goals and then achieve those goals. And my experience has been, regardless of the profession, regardless of their business, successful owners know their craft inside and out. Some are so invested in their business, they've told me they call it their baby. <laughs> they've grown it to levels they never would have imagined in the beginning. But before sitting down with me, uh, very few of them have thought so far enough into the future to envision the last few steps they would take. And that those last few steps involve their exit strategy, when they inevitably have to entrust that full grown baby to someone else. And that's why I'm excited to moderate this discussion to help business owners like you learn how to keep your business alive. Thank you so much, Terrence. I'd love to introduce you to today's presenter. Wendell Stallings is an advanced market sales director with Emeritus. He has spent the majority of his professional career in sales and sales management in the insurance and financial service industries. In addition to having been a field producer, Wendell has considerable experience providing consultation to financial advisors and their clients for life insurance and other financial products. At the broader industry level, Wendell serves on LIMRA's Advanced Sales Committee and has been a featured speaker at LIMRA's Advanced Sales Forum and the Charlotte, North Carolina chapters of the Society of Financial Service Professionals and the Financial Planning Association. Currently, Wendell holds a producer's license for life and health insurance in North Carolina with certified financial planner certification from CFP board and CLU and CHFC designations from the American College of Financial Services. Wendell is also fluent in Spanish. And Wendell, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen sharing. We're gonna turn the time over to you to present to our guest today. Wonderful. All right, thank you, Marche, and thank you, Terrence. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that you can see the presentation and the remarks that I'm going to be making. 
Um, first of all, I'd like to say it's a pleasure to, to be on with everyone here. If you're on the East Coast, uh, we're just after 12 noon, so it's the afternoon. If you're in other time zones, I'll say good morning to you. If by chance uh, for the session, if you do have a pen and paper, I think that that will be beneficial for you. There may be some notes that you'll want to take with some of the remarks I'm going to be delivering. And at the same time, during the session, we are going to be going through a, br a brief uh, risk profile uh, that will be a questionnaire, some different questions that I'm going to be asking. So again, if you do have a pen and paper, that is going to be helpful for you as far as being able to go through the specific risk assessment that we'll do here in just a little bit. All right, we have our lovely disclosures. And I'm going to start off by showing a, a picture of a gentleman. Some of you may know who this gentleman is, uh, some may not. Typically when I do this talk in live audiences, people are scratching their heads trying to figure out, okay, who is this person? Maybe you recognize him and, and maybe you don't. But if by chance you, you don't recognize who this person is, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a clue. And here is the clue. This is his wife. All right, if you recognize the picture of uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, uh, then you probably know that the gentleman uh, to her side was her husband, Aristotle Onassis. And Aristotle Onassis was an interesting man. He was a uh, Greek uh, shipping magnate. He was uh, very well uh, established in the shipping business, specifically post-World War II. Uh, he had a very lavish lifestyle, lived in the, in the Greek Isles, and he was one of the richest men in the world in his day. Interestingly, no, though, a lot of people don't really know what happened specifically to the Onassis fortune and the empire that he had built. Aristotle Onassis was a gentleman who was in the process of handing over his business interest to his son, Alexander. And he was grooming his son to, to take over the, the reins of the family empire. Unfortunately, in 1973, his son died in, in a plane accident. Uh, the son at the time was a, a high level executive with Olympic Airways, which was part of the, the Onassis uh, fortune and dynasty. But when the son died, Aristotle had to shift focus and begin to look to uh, his uh, younger daughter, uh, Christina, to be able to take over the, the family business as well. And so there were plans that were being established and made for that to happen. But unfortunately, Aristotle himself died two years later in 1975. And really, the formal handover really never took place in the way that he would have anticipated it to happen. And from that point on, Christina struggled with uh, many bouts of depression. Uh, she went into uh, just a very, very uh, difficult uh, time and stage in life. Uh, she ended up passing away in 1988 and handing over uh, the, what, the, the remainder of the, uh, the Onassis uh, fortune to her daughter, Athena, uh, who was the only surviving uh, heir of Aristotle Onassis. And so really at that point, as far as the, the, the business empire, uh, that really uh, diminished to a uh, to very insignificant degree. And I think in, in many ways, it's, it's a cautionary tale and it's instructive for many of us looking at someone like Aristotle Onassis, who was the richest man in the world in his day, seeing that his family empire really, uh, in the end, came to nothing. We really don't hear about uh, the Onassis dynasty or fortune in, in this day and age now. And it was because not necessarily that there wasn't specific planning that was engaged in and done, because he did have plans and he did plan to, uh, you know, to pass on the business uh, to other family members. But unfortunately, just um, you know, bad luck and, and, and things, you know, unfortunately in life that, that happened, uh, he was not able to actually execute the strategy that he had to be able to pass along the business and make sure that it were able to continue on a going forward basis. And so we're really going to be talking about today that idea of business continuation or succession planning. How do we do that? Just like Terrence had mentioned at the outset, when a business owner has that, that baby, 
that they've invested a significant amount of time and effort and energy to not only create, but to establish and to build up and to see it grow. How do we make sure that that business is, is preserved and it's able to continue in smooth operation going forward after that business owner decides to exit for whatever the reason or, or the case might be? And so during this session today, we're going to be giving you some, some key objectives as far as just a basic plan of attack on how to be able to specifically keep the business alive so that you can have that confidence and security knowing that if there are unforeseen situations, if there's a disability, if, you know, heaven forbid, uh, you might pass on, or a situation where you're looking to retire at some point in, in the future, that the business is able to still continue going forward and being able to preserve as much value as possible as well. Some of the items that we're going to cover in our agenda in our short time here today is we're going to be talking about what specifically is business continuation planning. What does it mean? We're also going to talk about some of the differences between effective and ineffective planning. Now, obviously, we just saw the situation with Aristotle Onassis. That was an example of ineffective planning, but we'll talk in more detail about the differences between the two. We're also going to be talking about what specifically is a buy-sell agreement and why it's important for your business. And we'll also talk about some of the common types of buy-sell agreements, their advantages and disadvantages as well. Now, when we talk about the specifics of business continuation planning, you know, some, some who uh, may either you know, be or have been in the corporate sector at a, a different point in time, sometimes they might associate business continuation with kind of a disaster recovery, uh, recovering from some type of maybe an IT outage or a, uh, an electrical power outage or some type of a hit to the electrical grid. For our purposes here this afternoon, we're not talking about that type of business continuation. What we're really talking about is being able to establish a process that's going to enable you as the business owner to be able to transfer your business at a particular point in time in the future in a way that you see fit when you see fit and at the same time being able to preserve as much business value as possible. So that's really our definition when we're talking about business continuation planning. Again, if you've worked hard to establish a business and to be able to have it grow, that it's a successful concern, it is serving clients, it's serving your employees and other interested parties, you want to be sure to make sure that that you preserve as much of that value as possible uh, going forward with whatever exit planning that you might engage in. So at this point, we're actually going to go through our, our risk assessment. Now, this is gonna be a, a series of questions. Don't worry necessarily about having to write these questions down. If you have a pen and a sheet of paper, what I'd like you to do is basically just number that sheet from one to 12, because we're gonna be going through a series of 12 questions that talk about business continuation planning. And what I think that you'll find for, for many people, what they find is that it's, it's very instructive and revealing to show just the level of planning that you may or may not have engaged in. So for each of these questions, I'm just gonna ask you to answer yes or no. So again, you just number the paper one to 12, and then for each of these questions, we'll go through those. And all you need to do is just answer a simple yes or no. So here we go. Let's start with the assessment. Question number one. First question is, have I created a formal business plan or a formal plan for business continuation? And is the plan on file? So have I created a formal business plan or a formal plan for business continuation? And is the plan on file? So just a simple yes or no. All right, question number two. Is disability factored into my continuation plan? So is disability factored into my continuation plan? Is there any type of specific provision or stipulation you've made for disability? Okay, next question, number three. Have my family and my key employees been engaged in my continuation planning? So have my family and key employees been engaged in my continuation planning? In other words, have you had any kind of conversations? Have you talked to your family? Have you talked to your key employees as far as 
this is the plan. If, uh, if I leave the business at some point or if something happens to me, this is going to be what happens as far as the, the process of the succession of the business. All right, next question. Have I identified and documented the successor management for the business? So have you identified and documented the successor management for the business? In other words, if you leave the business, if something happens to you, you know this is the person who's going to be taking over and that that person has been uh, documented, uh, has been identified in that it's in writing. All right, next question. And again, these are just yes and no answers. Have I notified my family and employees of the succession of management in my business? All right, so have I notified my family and my employees of the succession of the management of my business? Now, this is not just the key employees of the business, but really all of the employees, making sure that they understand and know what the plan of succession is. Next question, do I have disability coverage to fund a buy-sell agreement or to cover business overhead expenses? So do I have disability coverage to fund a buy-sell agreement or to cover expenses uh, relating to the business, uh, business overhead expenses? All right, next, have I undergone a third-party valuation for the business? In other words, have I gotten any type of an outside uh, appraisal or assessment to uh, determine the value of the business from, from some type of third party? All right, next question. Have I established a written buy-sell agreement for the business? Have I established a written buy-sell agreement for the business? Next, has the buy-sell agreement been funded with specific resources? Has the buy-sell agreement been funded with specific resources? Okay, next question. Has the buy-sell agreement been reviewed in the last three years? Has the buy-sell agreement been reviewed in the last three years? Okay, we have just a few more of these. Next question is, do I and my family know where the business's buy-sell agreement is filed? All right, so if you have a buy-sell agreement, do you know where it's kept? Where, where is it filed? Now, if you don't have a buy-sell agreement, the answer to this would be no. All right, next question. Have I created an action plan for keeping my key employees if I pass on, retire, or become disabled? I think this is the last question, actually. So have I created an action plan for keeping my key employees if I pass on, if I retire or if I become disabled. All right. All right, so that was the last question. So here's what I'd like you to do. Tally up from those 12 questions that we just went through, the number of yes responses that you, that you gave. So for those 12 questions, ever how many yeses that you answered, tally those up and we'll go through the results. All right. Now, if in that assessment, you answered 11 or 12 questions as yeses, that is tremendous. That's fantastic. You would be considered a very low risk as it relates to uh, business continuation or exit planning. Uh, or lack of it being something that could potentially undermine your business and undermine the value of your business overall. Um, not many people, quite frankly, fall into that category. So if that does describe you, if you have 11 or 12 that you answered yeses, 
uh, I give you kudos uh, because again, that's something that, uh, that I find when I do this assessment is, is quite rare. Now, if you're in the nine to 10 range, well, we would consider you to be a moderate risk, meaning that you actually have done a, a pretty good job as far as doing some concrete planning for your, your exit of your business. But at the same time, there are some additional areas that could be looked at in terms of just shoring things up to make sure that uh, you're in the maximum uh, area of preparedness. Now, if you answered six to eight questions as yeses, a little bit more of a dangerous situation there. We wouldn't, we would describe you as a dangerous risk and it really would, I think, behoove you to, to engage in some more concrete planning as it relates to just understanding the various factors and elements that are at play uh, to make sure that you're adequately prepared uh, when that time comes for you to exit the business. And then I would say if it's five or below that you answered yeses, uh, that would be considered a severe risk. And quite frankly, most people are in that either dangerous or severe risk area. So if that does describe you, take heart, don't feel bad, just to understand that we're bringing awareness to you to help you understand that there may be some, some additional planning that would need to be done to make sure that you are thoroughly prepared for when that event happens. Uh, again, whether it's retirement, disability, an unforeseen death or other situation that would necessitate an exit from, from the business. All right, so in, in talking about businesses and, and business failure, you know, there's a lot of different elements that come into play and a lot of reasons that, that businesses may fail. Now, we, we understand that, you know, certainly a large percentage of, of businesses that are established in terms of new businesses uh, do tend to fail. But it happens for a number of different reasons. I mean, I think the first one, profitability, is pretty much a no-brainer. If a business isn't turning a profit, it's not going to be in business for, for very long. But sometimes there are issues as far as being able to anticipate needs for the market and just how um, the business environment or the specific products or services that are offered, uh, taste may change over, over time. Sometimes there are issues as it relates to to a, a loss or a lack of demand for those products or services. A lot of times I think about Kodak. Years back when we looked at photographic film, Kodak was a very big name. And now you really don't hear about Kodak at all after we've gone into digital photography and you know, now you don't need film to, uh, to, to be able to take pictures. Everybody has either their phone or just a regular digital camera uh, that they can do that with. Um, so there, there are a number of different reasons. Sometimes a lack of leadership and vision as well can come into play. But with all of those different reasons that a business can fail, even if you as a business owner are able to jump through the, the hurdles and be able to overcome these types of challenges in establishing the business, if you don't do an effective job in really looking at these succession planning type issues, those in and of themselves can actually lead to the failure of the business and it being undermined specifically in terms of being able to hand that business off to the next generation, whether it is you know, to a child maybe that you have in mind that would be looking to take over the business or it could be a key employee or possibly a competitor but some type of situation that allows you to be able to receive the maximum value for the business, it's important to really engage in this topic or in this, this succession planning to make sure that the business is handed off uh, in an effective way. So let's talk about for a moment here, what makes a business continuation plan effective? And there are some key questions, and these are in addition to some of the ones that we looked at in the specific uh, risk profile or the risk assessment that we just did. Some of those questions are the following, you know, has there been successor management that's been identified and also trained to be able to operate the business? That's something that's cool and that's very important. Number two is would the business generate a sufficient return for you as the owner or for your family if you're no longer in, in the picture? And this, you know, sometimes is, is a situation that, that can get overlooked. There are some situations where maybe if the business over time has, has seen um, results begin to decline or to, to dwindle. Sometimes it's, it's helpful 
to either bring in new management with fresh ideas, <clears throat> excuse me, or to be able to sell the business and to be able to have new ownership come in and, and be able to, um, to incorporate some ideas that can help to, to boost uh, the, uh, the returns for, for the business. But that's, that's certainly a consideration. If it's a situation where maybe the return on the business isn't adequate, uh, there certainly may be some, some measures that would be looked at and taken to, to remedy that situation. Number three is, is there a strong desire to establish or continue family involvement in the business? This is a dynamic that we see quite a lot where the, the business owner may have a specific plan in mind as far as, okay, at some point in the future, Johnny's going to take over the business and you know, I'm, I'm basically going to have him run things where I'm going to sell the business to him. He's going to come in, buy the business and, and take over. And then I'll be able to retire with the proceeds that, that I receive. But if Johnny has plans to uh, go do Peace Corps, or maybe he wants to go be a part of a rock and roll band and you know, move out to LA, those objectives could be running across hairs. And so there really needs to be some, some concrete dialogue uh, to make sure that the other family members are on board with the plan uh, that you as a business owner may be establishing. If there's a disconnect there, there may need to be some adjustments with, with that planning. Another question is, is there a willing buyer available for the business? This is an important question as well. A lot of times when we're talking about the, the business that we typically uh, are, are working with, tend to be smaller, closely held businesses, a lot of them family owned, but there may not necessarily be a, an active buyer uh, right there waiting in the wings uh, if, uh, if something were to happen and the business needed to, to be sold. I think another question that comes up is how much is the business worth? Sometimes a, a business owner will have an idea, maybe a vague idea in their head as far as how much they think the business is worth but it hasn't been validated by any type of a, a third party. There wasn't an outside assessment that was done. And as a result, it can really put that business owner in a position of weakness in that if, for example, if I as a business owner, if I think my business is worth $10 million, but I have an outside appraiser come in and say, well, it's really only worth $5 million, that can be a problem. If I'm engaged in any type of a negotiation, and I have an inflated perception in my own mind of what the business is worth, what can happen is it can lead to a lot of contention and discord in a negotiation because I'm thinking that someone else is, is trying to uh, offer me a, a, a low ball offer. They're, they're trying to offer me something that's, that's less than it, what in my mind I think the business is worth, uh, whereas my own perception is causing the, uh, the, the, the overinflated value and it may cause me to, uh, to not accept what would be a suitable offer for the business. By the same token, on the flip side, if I have an under, if I have a lower valuation in my own mind than what the business is really worth, I could actually be susceptible to accepting a lowball offer and then not receiving the full fair market value of the business. And I could be leaving money on the table. So this idea of how much a business is worth is, is really, really important. The next uh, question would be, how would the business be disposed? Wendell, do you mind if we uh, interject there? Yeah, sure. Yeah, not, not a problem at all. Uh, we have a question here. Can you elaborate on how to determine business valuation? How do you, how do you figure out a, a realistic value for your business. Okay, so how, how do you determine that, that value? A lot of times what, what I find is helpful, uh, because I myself am not a, a valuation expert, what I find is helpful is to, to be able to utilize uh, third-party services. Um, specifically within our, within our firm, that's typically what we do is we actually have a third party uh, that provides for valuation services. And they will work on a number of different metrics. Typically, they will, um, they will take uh, financial data from the last three years. They'll look at uh, cash flow statements. They'll look at uh, the P&Ls, uh, profit and loss statements, and uh, balance sheets over three years and 
come up with a preliminary value in conjunction with uh, comps, which are businesses in the same industry that have been sold within a specified period of time. Um, a lot of times they'll use uh, EBITDA data with industry multiples, but a number of different metrics that they use to be able to determine a, a, a suitable range of value that can be used as a good starting point for a business in entering into any type of negotiation or establishing a, um, a buy-sell agreement, if you will. Uh, but those, those you know, measures are, are helpful. Does that help? It looks like it does. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. So another question is how, how is the business going to, to be disposed? When it comes time to actually exit the business, is, is the plan to, to sell the business outright? Is the plan possibly to just install new management and retain ownership of the business and still be able to receive uh, income from the business? but having it under, uh, under separate management where you're not having to be involved day to day in the, the operations of the business. Um, you know, what happens if maybe the business isn't, um, is maybe a, a specialized niche type of business that's not that easy to necessarily be sold to an outside buyer. There may be situations where uh, the business owner just decides to liquidate the assets and be able to uh, you know, carry whatever, uh, whatever amount would be the remainder of what they can receive from the sale of the assets in the business. But these kinds of questions need to be considered as well. And one of the other key questions is, do the key employees that are in that business, do they have specific incentives to stay and work for the new owners? Is there some type of golden handcuff arrangement that keeps those, those uh, key people in the business remaining in service with the business. That's a very important consideration because for me, if, if I'm looking to purchase a business and I know that there are sp specific key people that are involved in that business, I need to have the, the assurance that those people are going to be staying. Otherwise, it's really going to uh, affect what I would be willing to offer for that business if I've got to go back and now try to find other people to replace those that uh, would be leaving as, as key people. Now, some of the, the challenges that we have in this whole dynamic of considering the need for succession planning deals with the, the time management matrix. And this was something that uh, Stephen Covey came up with, who was the author of the seven habits of highly effective people. In those seven habits, his uh, habit number three um, was uh, putting, uh, putting first things first. And I, I think that in many respects, some of the challenges that we find in dealing with business owners is just this idea of dealing with issues and matters that are important and urgent, some of those type, you know, crises type situations, the emergencies, the things that just demand immediate attention now, which really falls into that first quadrant of the important and urgent issues that Covey talked about. And as important as those things are to, to deal with, what he found was that business owners and just people in general that tend to be the most effective in life spend the bulk of their time in that second quadrant in the intersection of the important but not urgent items. And this deals more with really long-term planning, long-term preparation, being able to engage in those types of activities that aren't necessarily the fires that have to be put out today, but are important matters, but really have a, a view of more longer term engagement and planning and preparation. And what we're talking about specifically with this business continuation planning really falls within that quadrant. But because a lot of times, you know, business owners are just dealing with, you know, kind of the, the, the day to day elements of just running the business, maybe dealing with personnel issues, dealing with supplier issues. Uh, you know, dealing with all kinds of things that are you know, involved in running a business, a lot of times it can be difficult to take some time and just take a step back and say, okay, I, I need to start engaging in some more longer term planning as it relates to, to the business. And because for many business owners, they don't take the time 
to engage in this type of planning that we're talking about, it, it can really lead to some detrimental effects. And we see the, the statistics here even on the screen as far as just the cost of, of not effectively planning. You know, 30% of family-owned business owners um, survive to the, to the next generation. That means 70% don't. So, you know, to avoid being one of the negative statistics, it's important to really take the initiative to effectively plan and to act now so that your business doesn't become one of those statistics that's in the 70% that doesn't make it uh, to the next generation or that becomes like Aristotle Onassis, who even despite his efforts to, to, to make plans because of uh, just unforeseen circumstances in life uh, that his plans did not come to fruition as he would have hoped that, that they would have. So let's talk for uh, just a, a little bit here as far as what is a buy-sell agreement. Now, buy-sell agreement, I'll give you the legalese here. It's, it's a legal contract that restricts the rights to dispose of a business interest to specified parties under specified terms. All right, what does that mean in plain English? A buy-sell agreement is basically a contract that stipulates that when a specific triggering event occurs, that one party has the legal obligation to sell the business and the other party has the legal obligation to buy the business. So it is a binding contractual arrangement. Again, it stipulates that one party has to buy, one party has to sell, when there is a specific event that takes place. Now, there are a number of these triggers that can be integrated into these contracts. Some of the most common that you'll see are death, disability, uh, if the business owner retires, um, if, if they decide to you know, just leave the business um, outside of retirement. Oh, I'm just tired, I'm just, I'm just gonna leave. Sometimes divorce can be one of those triggers. Um, or if there is financial duress and creditors come in and, and begin to seize, uh, seize property, that also can be a trigger uh, that allows that buy-sell agreement to, to come into effect. So these arrangements can be structured in a number of different ways, but there are specified advantages for a business to create this type of, agree of agreement. One of the key advantages is that it provides for a ready market for the business because it creates a situation where somebody has to buy the business while the business owner is legally obligated to sell the business. For the most part, typically the, the businesses that we work with are not businesses that are being actively traded on any type of uh, stock market or a stock exchange. Typically, we're talking about, if, if we are talking about corporations, they're, they're small, closely held corporations uh, where the stock, again, is not trading openly in the public market. And so being able to have a ready market where there is an established buyer that's locked in to being able to, to purchase that business at some specified point in time uh, really can alleviate a lot of pressure on the business owner and avert a situation where there's a forced sale where that business owner would only receive a fraction of what the true fair market value of that business would be. Now, one of the other advantages in a buy-sell agreement is it also establishes some type of a methodology or a specific value for the business or a formula to be able to determine the business's value that's integrated in the agreement itself. Uh, so that's another advantage in uh, having a buy-sell agreement. Now, one point that I do wanna make, and this is a very important point, Sometimes business owners will take the, the initiative and, and go through the effort to create a buy-sell agreement, but they'll just leave it at that. They may have a buy-sell agreement in place, but there's no specific funding mechanism to make sure that when that triggering event occurs, there's actually cash on hand to be able to effectuate the purchase of that business. And that's a big mistake that you know, a number of business owners make. The funding of the buy-sell agreement is essential because if you've got an agreement, but you don't have any funding mechanism in place, it really makes the agreement powerless. Not powerless from the standpoint that the legal obligation is removed because the legal obligation is still there regardless. 
but without the money available to actually effectuate the agreement, how are you going to be able to actually uh, make that agreement uh, real and, and binding? Now, there are a number of options that people uh, use and can use to be able to fund these buy-sell agreements. We'll talk about some of those here. Having cash on hand, um, most of the time, a, a business will not necessarily have cash on hand. In some situations, they might, if it's a, if it's a large concern, it's highly profitable. Um, but in many situations for the types of situations that, that um, I typically work with and consult businesses on, um, having that extra cash on hand to purchase a business can, uh, can really be an, an encumbrance for a business because usually they're working with that type of capital as far as reinvesting in the operations of, of the business itself. And so, you know, cash a lot of times is, is not necessarily the, the number one option. They may have some type of accumulated assets that are, that are um, working and operating in, in the business that potentially could be used. But again, that's really not an ideal situation. Sometimes there is a sinking fund that's established um, where a, a, burst, a, a business or the person that would be considering purchasing the business uh, may set aside some funds incrementally over time to be able to make that purchase. Sometimes loans can be used. Um, there are pros and cons with, with loans. One of the, the issues may be the debt service. If you have someone who takes a loan to be able to purchase a business, well, now, depending on the terms of the loan, is the debt service going to be to an extent that it's going to create a drain on the business as far as being able to maintain that debt service and also be able to fund the actual operations of the business? Not to mention, sometimes in dealing with um, banks or, or, or other lenders, if you have a business that has lost its, uh, its uh, owner or main proprietor, uh, sometimes that can be viewed as more of a credit risk. And so it may be a little more challenging as far as being able to obtain a loan or to obtain a loan uh, with favorable terms. Sometimes installment purchases can be done where the buyer will put down a, a down payment for the business and then be able to pay the remainder in installments over, over time. That certainly poses a risk for the seller of the business because what happens if the business suffers some type of a, a decline and now the monies aren't there to be able to repay the, uh, the original owner uh, for the, uh, the terms of the installment? Uh, that can certainly be an, an issue and a potential risk. A lot of times what we do see as far as the most efficient way of funding this type of situation and obligation would be through insurance. Uh, whether it's life insurance or sometimes um, you know, disability buyout insurance can be used as well. The reason that insurance funding works so well is that it creates a, uh, a, a lump sum as a pool of money in cash when there is a death or a disability uh, that, is, uh, that is brought into the, uh, the hands of the buyer. And at the same time, the outlay is considerably less than having to accumulate the entire purchase price through a sinking fund uh, or through a loan where obviously there's going to be additional uh, interest costs associated with that. Uh, typically with insurance funding, it allows for a buyer to be able to uh, purchase a policy with coverage uh, where the premiums are a, a small percentage of the total benefit that would be received on the back end. And sometimes there can be a combination of all of these different types of methods that, that can be used as, as well. The important thing to understand and note is that the funding of the buy-sell agreement is a, a critical element of having a plan that is actually effective so that it achieves the objectives of the business owner. And we'll talk about here just uh, some of the key types of buy-sell agreements. I'm not going to go into all of these just for time's sake, uh, but just to go through the different types. Typically, when we talk about buy-sell agreements, uh, we'll talk about a, a cross-purchase agreement. Typically, that's going to involve uh, two partners or owners in a business, a stock redemption or an entity plan, 
a lot of times that will deal with a corporation that has various stockholders and how to be able to uh, effectuate a buyout of one or more stockholders when a particular uh, triggering event takes place. There are some others. Uh, one's called a trustee cross purchase that involves the use of a trustee. Uh, a wait and see plan is more of less of a, of a contingency type of situation uh, where there may be a uh, multiplicity of, of, of different outcomes and it allows for additional flexibility as far as tailoring that agreement um, depending on uh, specific contingencies as they play out in real life. And then the buy sell LLC is a different type of arrangement that uses a limited liability company as the funnel through which uh, the insurance coverages and the payouts are, are effectuated through. So for, for our purposes, I'm just gonna talk about the two, the, the, the cross purchase I'll also talk about the entity arrangement just to give you an understanding in a general sense of, of how these two type of, uh, types of agreements would work. Now with the cross purchase, like I mentioned, it's an agreement that typically involves two, uh, two parties to, to the agreement. It could be um, you know, two uh, partners, uh, two owners in the business. Uh, sometimes it might involve the owner and um, you know, and another party, uh, a key competitor, uh, or, you know, or whatever the case might, might be. But let's say just in this instance, you've got two partners that are working together in, in a business. And the way that this works is that for the cross purchase, we'll specifically talk about from a life insurance standpoint, that there's an agreement that's reached between the two owners and the two partners in the business, such that each one of them purchases a, a life insurance policy on the other in the amount of their respective share of ownership in the business so that the premiums are being paid by each of the owners to the insurance company. And when the triggering event occurs in this case, if it, if it were death, let's say owner A passes on, his share of the business would pass to his family or, or his estate, but because of the buy-sell agreement, they would be obligated to sell the business to the other owner who has received the death proceeds from the insurance company and then consequently uses that death benefit to purchase the shares of the business uh, from the, the family or the estate of the, uh, the other owner who has deceased. And so now owner B is able to go away with full control of the business. The family or the estate receives uh, the, the payment for that portion of the business and then they part company and they're able to go their separate ways. And that's an example of a cross purchase agreement. The second being an entity purchase, a lot of times this will involve uh, more than two owners. Uh, in this situation, we just have two, but just to, to illustratively show how this works, instead of the two parties purchasing life insurance on one another, what happens is the business in its own capacity actually purchases the coverage on each of the owners. And as a result, when one of the owners passes on, the death proceeds come into the business and the business in its capacity effectuates the buyout of the, the deceased owner. And we see an example of that here on this, uh, this slide here. Owner A passes on, the stock goes to the family or the estate, but the business in its own capacity actually purchases uh, that business interest from the deceased owner's estate. And then that will become treasury stock for the business. Owner B still has all of the outstanding shares and goes away with full control of of the business. So these are just a couple of examples of how this would work um, specifically in, in a life insurance type scenario. And again, there, there are other uh, means by which uh, these agreements can, can be tailored and the funding can be, uh, can be put into place for them. So let me just go through just a very brief summary of some of these benefits. In a buy-sell agreement, as we talked about before, it identifies a successor for the business, which is very important. It legally binds those parties to either buy or sell the business interest when there is a specified triggering event that takes place. And will also specifically define what those events are that would necessitate that 
buy-sell agreement coming into effect and, and being acted upon. It creates a ready market for the business and it also establishes either some type of a, a methodology or a specific formula or actual value for the business um, so that there's no disputing of that after the fact. And there's some other benefits as well that I hadn't really mentioned beforehand, but these are important as well. As far as being able to preserve the, the value of the business and averting a forced sale, that's very important because in many situations, and you may have seen or come across situations where people have um, estate sales, um, typically that's because there is some type of a tax liability that's due and the family has to sell assets of the estate to be able to pay the corresponding taxes that are, that are due uh, because of um, you know, an unforeseen death. In a situation where a business is involved, if a business has to be sold in an unexpected manner, typically there's only going to be a, a, a smaller percentage of the value of the business that's going to be preserved. And so to be able to avert that, these buy-sell agreements are put into place and they can be very effective in, in doing so. One of the other things with a buy-sell agreement is it also increases the value of the business relative to the, uh, the peer group um, of other businesses that don't necessarily have these types of plans in place. And it can also increase the credit worthiness of the business overall. Now, here's what I wanna say just uh, to, to conclude before we take some, some additional questions before we end the session. For you as a business owner, if you have created a business that is a successful going concern, that business obviously is contributing to the overall prosperity of the economy. There are multiple constituencies that have a vested interest in your business continuing to be prosperous and successful. Obviously, the business is benefiting yourself and your family. That business is benefiting your employees that depend on it for their, their, you know, their, their livelihood. There probably are other customers, uh, suppliers that your business is serving, uh, lenders maybe that you're working with, that all of these parties have a vested interest in your business being successful. And just again, from the prospect or from the standpoint of just the overall economy, you know, small businesses are hugely important in the success of the overall national economy. And so when it comes to your succession planning, don't let a lack of action undermine the work that you've done over all of the years that you've had your business uh, to be able to have that continue to be a successful going concern that can continue to serve your customers, that can continue to serve your employees and the other parties that have, again, a vested interest in seeing your business continue to thrive and move forward being successful. We hope that the information that's been provided to you here today uh, that you can use, that it will really be a springboard uh, to some type of, of positive action and that it can be empowering for you in knowing that you can have a business that does survive and that uh, can go forward and continue to, to prosper and to be successful. All right, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and open it up for any specific uh, additional questions that anyone may have. Wendell, there's a few questions here. Uh, one of the questions is, at what point do you tell your employees about your plans for business succession? I mean, I, I would say um, as far as when to tell them, I think it really depends on, on the business. I mean, I would start off at the very least with kind of that, that core group. If you've got a, a key employee group or, or a leadership group, at the very least, they should know and be aware of, of what those plans are. I think as far as cascading that out to you know, the larger employee base, I think it depends on, first of all, how many employees you have, how close knit the, the business is. And also, you know, and, and obviously for you as a business owner, you know your, your personnel and your business you know, better than anybody else, what type of effect that disclosure would have to the you know, larger employee population. I mean, if that disclosure is made, are people going to be thinking, wow, you know, the, the owner, he's, he's going to be, you know, leaving, or are they going to have questions as far as, you know, your departure being, being imminent? 
or is it just a situation where, hey, we're just you know engaging in this type of planning now um, to make everybody aware and give them the heads up? I think obviously there has to be care taken with that type of communication, but I think anticipating the the impact of the communication and what other ancillary questions that that may bring up uh, would determine you know when it's appropriate to uh, to actually. Um, engage and, and have those questions be, be, or disclosures be put forth to, to employees. Okay, excellent. Uh, here's another one. This all is very good information, uh, but it looks like a, a pretty uh, hefty process. How, how long does it take to put together a business succession plan? How long does it take to put together? It, it really depends. I mean, I would say that it's best to work with a qualified advisor, you know, with uh, these types of strategies, because it, it is a, it is a significant undertaking. I mean, let's not you know make any mistakes about that. I think to the extent that you have an advisor that is working with you to be able to kind of hold your hand through the process, um, certainly helps so that you're not feeling that this is an undertaking that you're just you know going through by by yourself. Um, it can take. I mean, obviously, there's there's legal documents that have to be drafted. There are conversations that have to be uh, engaged in as far as the valuation of the business. Uh, that's another element that has to be done. So, you know, these things take take time. I mean, I would say anywhere from you know uh, a couple of months um, to you know six months as far as your know, reasonable time frame to expect you know all the elements to um, to be put together and for the conversations and the communication to, to be had I would usually look in some some type of time frame um, relative to that two to six months okay and I'm sure depending on how many parties are involved if you have just a two two individuals as opposed to you know uh, two two co-owners as opposed to five six seven ten, that would make a difference too, probably. Exactly. Yep, that's a big factor too. But what percentage of businesses would you estimate have a buy sell agreement? You know, I would say. I mean, there was there was a study that was done a few years ago by uh, Highland Capital Brokerage that they estimated, as far as businesses that had a buy sell agreement in place um, to deal with the contingency of death, it was somewhere around twenty one percent of uh, small closely held businesses had something like that. And for those that had provisions for disability, somewhere around 13%. I would say in my work with business owners and in conversations and you know, just looking at their situation, that seems to be about right. Um, it's, it's definitely not the majority for, for sure, but somewhere in that, in that range, you know, 20%, 21% seems, seems to be you know, pretty accurate. I guess that goes to the point that you mentioned in your uh, presentation where only 30% of businesses pass on to the second generation. It, there might be a pretty close correlation if only 21% of businesses on average uh, have a succession plan or a buy-sell agreement. Um, that might explain why only 30% of businesses last to the second generation. Correct. Um, can you give an example of how disability would be planned for? Disability would be planned for typically by purchasing outside coverage uh, from, from an insurance company that handles disability so that if there is, when we're, when we're talking about specifically in a buy-sell context, uh, if there is some type of a catastrophic disability to an owner uh, that would prevent that person from being engaged in the business for a prolonged period of time, uh, there's what's called disability buyout coverage. Uh, whereby there are funds that are provided from the insurance company that would allow for the, the, the buyout to take place for, for the business. Um, so now, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, one of the other owners is able to, to take over in lieu, for, in lieu of the cash that would be provided as a result of the extended disability of, of one of the owners. Uh, and there are various provisions for that. Um, that's a little bit different from talking about just the basic disability and providing income uh, to one of the owners in the event of a personal disability. So it's, it's kind of a, a two different scenarios, 
Uh, but when we talk about disability, we're typically talking about some type of a coverage that would uh, provide funds to either the business uh, and or the owner in the event that there's an injury or sickness that prevents them from being able to work um, for an extended period of time. Excellent. Okay, thanks. We had two more questions. Uh, the, sec the second to last one is, how does our current COVID-19 pandemic factor into what we're talking about today? It's a very good question. I think with COVID-19, um, you know, this is a situation where when, when you have an unexpected disruption to, to the economy, you know, to the overall economy, it, it, it affects, you know, pretty much every sector. I, I think now with some businesses, and I'd say particularly those that are, you know, in the, the hospitality area, you know, we've seen those businesses tend to suffer the, the, the most. We, you know, we have seen some of that come back, which I think has been encouraging. But, you know, at the same time, we've also seen, you know, quite a number of, of business failures as, as a result. I think really the, the main effect of that is if a business were, con were considering um, selling the business potentially at, at this time right now, it may give the business owner some pause as far as doing that in a, a depressed economic environment. Meaning that if, if earnings were substantially lower last year than historically they would have been, it's, it's hard to make the, the justification from a valuation standpoint that my business is worth as much as it was prior to COVID when my earnings were, were, were higher. So it may mean that maybe there's a delay as far as you know, making that exit from the business until the economic cycle turns back around again and, and things begin to you know, go on, on an uptick. I mean, obviously we've seen a lot you know, with, with the stock market that has, has been high, but that's still a difference from the actual uh, revenues and results that businesses are, are actually producing. So I, I think in some ways it's causing business owners to be a little more conservative uh, with their operations and with um, just saving more reserves in, in the business. Um, but the larger issue is the timing of, of the exit and possibly having to make adjustments as it relates to the business cycle improving and being able to have those higher valuations once that does happen. Okay, nice. And final question is, do you have any feedback on what business owners can do today to increase the value of their business? Yeah, I would say there's a number of things that business owners can do to increase the value of their business. I mean, one of the, the simple things is just really having a, a good gauge about just the the physical structure and presence of your business. I mean, if you're operating a brick and mortar business or if you're operating out of, you know, a, um, out of a, a building, you know, making sure that the environment is, is clean, is, is tidy, is visually appealing and attractive. Um, neatness is one of those things that goes a long way. If you have a suitor coming in to take a look at your business uh, to potentially purchase or take it over, First impressions are very important. So making sure that your work environment and all your facilities are, are neat, they're clean, they're up to date um, is, you know, is, is certainly uh, beneficial. I would say in addition to that, if you have specified manuals that really outline uh, operational procedures for the business, that's important as well. If you have a suitor that's coming to, to take over the business, uh, but they really don't have any type of guidelines as far as how you know critical uh, functions are performed, uh, how uh, you know various you know departments are, are run or, or operated. To the extent that you have um, operational manuals that really uh, kind of make things easy for that potential suitor to come in and to be able to just kind of hit the ground running, uh, that's certainly something that's that's helpful as well. I would say in addition to that. If you have any type of golden handcuff arrangement in place for those key employees to incentivize them to stay in the event that there's a change of ownership, that's something that's very important as well. That can definitely increase the value of, of the business relative to other businesses that don't have those types of, of structures in place. 
And I would say what, one of the other things is really just making sure as far as your overall sales, that um, the, the sales aren't concentrated in you know, one or two uh, customers or, or key accounts. To the extent that you have your overall sales results spread over a, a larger customer base, um, that certainly can be, can be helpful as well. And the, the last thing that I would say is in a situation where you've got a potential suitor that's looking at the business and, and things get to the point where that suitor is engaged in some type of due diligence uh, review of the business, really making sure that your business results stay high during that due diligence period. You, you don't want to see a, a significant lag or drop in your, your revenues or your business results during that due diligence period, because that could give that um, potential buyer reason to come back and to lower their offer. Uh, and you just don't want to give them a reason to think that, um, that there may be issues or problems with, uh, with, with the business. Thank you. Folks, thank you so much. We really want to thank our presenter today and our moderator organizations that have worked with us to bring you this webinar today. Thank you so much for our attendees. Uh, look for an email soon with a link to a, the replay of this event. And you're welcome to share that replay with your friends and family. Here at Advice Chaser, we're all about helping you find a financial advisor who is a great fit for your life and your financial questions. Our matching service is free to you and every one of our advisor partners has committed to offer a free initial consultation to anyone we introduce them to. So find out more by going to advicechaser.com and clicking on the link to find an advisor. Once again, from Advice Chaser, thank you so much for coming and we'll see you at another webinar soon. Bye everyone.